In the reading this week from Mark, we continue from the events of last week with Jesus again predicting his death. Jesus' public ministry in and around Galilee was completed and he's on his way to Jerusalem to die. Jesus again tells them of his pending betrayal, death and resurrection. But his disciples still don't seem to understand what he was saying and they were afraid to ask. Maybe they were scared to ask because, uh, as we heard last week, Peter was rebuked when he talked about his first prediction of death. And perhaps the disciples couldn't grasp that Jesus, who they believed was the Son of God, the Messiah, was going to die. They'd been more preoccupied with the earthly kingdom they thought that Jesus would bring and their amazing position in that earthly kingdom. And it was a belief at the same at the, that time that the Messiah would overthrow the Romans and establish an earthly kingdom. And if it were so, wouldn't his little group of followers have a huge role in this fabulous new kingdom? But if Jesus died, this kingdom would not come and they may have to be, might have been wasting their time following him. So basically, it seems they didn't want to hear what Jesus was saying about his death. They were too busy arguing about power and position and their perceived kingdom. When I was reading this passage, I thought of the many disasters that happen in the world as a result of leaders' desire for power and prestige. It is sad to think of the thousands of lives that have been lost throughout history as a result of people's ambition and the grab for power. Last week, we remembered the tragedy of 9-11, and we're still saddened by the fighting in Afghanistan and what that might mean for the people of that country, particularly for the women and the girls. So Jesus taught them about servanthood. Jesus taught them how it was that if you want to be first, you must be last and the servant of all. How typical of Jesus to turn everything that was considered right and normal upside down, to tell them that greatness comes in serving. And then Jesus takes a child in his arms and declares that to welcome one who is powerless and vulnerable is also to welcome Jesus. You know, back then, children had no standing or power or position. And uh, even though they were the last to be cared for whenever there was a tough time, they were actually considered second-class citizens. And even today, although many children are involved, indulged, there's millions of children in the world today who are treated very poorly and are powerless to change their circumstances. Jesus was saying that you need to lower yourself to nothing in order to be able to allow the power of the Holy Spirit to make your life great for God. As some of you know, I used to work with children in schools. I loved the way that little children just look up at you as if you're the oracle. They hang on your every word. And they come to school like little sponges ready to soak up every ounce of teaching that's available. They are wide-eyed. They're enthusiastic and think that their teachers are the second best thing to mum and dad. I wonder, have you ever watched your children or grandchildren play and they play school with their friends, with them as the teacher? Yes, I reckon my teacher said are powerful words for children and they're very hard to argue against. 
And this is the way that Jesus wants his disciples to be. So does that mean that we as Christians cannot be ambitious or strive to succeed in leadership? Now, if we look at Jesus, what Jesus is saying on face value, we could become doormats with absolutely no ambition and so busy serving that we'd have no leaders. But that's not what Jesus is saying. What he's actually saying is that it's no great sin to be industrious. But when these things push obedience and service to others uh, to one side, then we should be doing things. We could be doing things for the wrong reason. Leadership in our church is important. We all know that the role of elder and church counsellor and treasurer and chairperson and pianist and techos that do Zoom and the, and, uh, and the list could go on. But what exactly does effective leadership mean? And who or what makes a good leader? Now, I'm making an assumption here this morning. I'm assuming that many of you would have read a lesson from Canadi the Canadian geese on leadership that speaks of the amazing example of a flock of Canadian geese. Well, first of all, the flock flies together. And because of that, they give lift to the whole flock and they can fly great distances. Another thing that strikes me from this lesson is that all of us have the ability to be leaders. And those who are leaders can be more effective if they're supported by those they are working with. In our church, we're able, with God's help, to do many amazing things to build up the body, that is, the church. And another thing that struck me is that the geese rotate the leadership. Now, when one of is tired, it drops back and another goose takes up the lead position. I have a little quote, and I think that it says it all. A good leader needs energy, wisdom and patience. And every so often, a bit of a lie down. So it's good to allow our leaders time to revive and renew. And it's important for us to encourage each other in the church to take on leadership roles and so effectively rotate the lead. And the thing that I like most about this lesson from the Canadian geese is that the geese in the flock honk encouragement to the leaders. It is much easier to lead when you have the support and the positive reinforcement from the people in the group. And we all need to rely on one another as through God, we uphold each other as part of the body of Christ. So from this reading, we can see that effective leadership comes as we serve and support others. Jesus' leadership, words and actions certainly went against the normal standards of the day. He turned many notions upside down, talking to women, valuing children, touching the diseased and caring for the poor, associating with sinners and being humble, even to death. Not the way the people thought that a son of God would have behaved. He blew people's minds back then and he still blows our minds today. Our society is not all that different from the time of Jesus. Sure, we have superior technology, but there is still a huge gap between the haves and the have-nots. Money, position and power seem to be the driving force of so many, and it's expected that people will be ruthless to gain their ambitions. And Jesus is calling us to go against the flow to submit ourselves to God. In the James reading, we find that James doesn't pull any punches in his writing. Sometimes James can be hard going as he can really slap the wrist of believers with his hard hitting words. 
He tells how things can go wrong if our motives are selfish and not God-driven. True wisdom comes from God. God reckons a person is wise when they put selfishness aside and show concern for others. And Christians can sell out to the world and not even realise it. And this happens when we plan our lives without reference to God. How important that is that we follow God's direction. We need to pray in accordance with God's will and allowing God to guide our lives. And this means letting go of self and allowing the Holy Spirit to work more effectively in our lives. And this is what Jesus is saying to his disciples and to us today, to accept him as a child with childlike qualities. And why? Because if we become as children, we will rely on God for our every need. Accepting Jesus with the same powerlessness of a child is the key to allowing the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. We should pray for guidance. Why? Because we know that if we have guidance, we know the way to go. Our work and our play, we should, in our work and our play, we should be looking to Jesus so that we can become great for him. The body of Christ, the church, is made up of different people with different talents, and we need to work together using our special talents for God's glory, as it is with the Canadian geese when they fly in a flock. Working together makes all the difference to their distance that they can travel and to the lift that they get from one another. Mother Teresa is remembered as a truly remarkable and great woman, but her greatness and her notoriety grew out of humble service for God in caring for the least and the rejected in the world. She understood that to welcome those who are powerless and vulnerable is to welcome Jesus. Jesus' disciples needed to learn the ways of God from Jesus, and we today need to learn from Jesus' example. We continue to learn. And the great gift of God is that God continues to teach us. That's if we're prepared to listen and to learn. The Christian life is a journey of discovery. So if you think you were there, I'm sorry, guys, you're not, as there is heaps and heaps more to learn from God. We need to understand that spiritual growth is not instant. It takes a lifetime to become the great servants Jesus needs to foster his kingdom here on earth. The disciples only had three years to learn from Jesus. It's taken me almost 70 years and I'm still learning. And I'm sure most of you will agree that you're also on that journey of discovery. And James sums it up when he says, submit yourself then to God. Take on God as a child with those amazing, wide-eyed, childlike qualities. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Who are the greatest in the kingdom of God? Who are those who use wisdom in service? Those who open themselves up to the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives and set their sights on Jesus as their leader and guide. We need to share of our souls, to welcome those who are vulnerable, to be prepared to stand up for the good of others, to encourage others and to use our talents as motivated by God. For if we cannot find and give welcome to all here in our church community, where can it be found? Amen.